Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at least, on my review of Sphere by Michael Crichton. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I may have moved house by the time that I finished reading this. I mean, I'm over halfway through, so I've got a good chunk and a bunch of tabs I can share with you now. Um, but I'm trying to get on top of my filming before I move, because then it's going to, you know what, it, you know what it's like. So, anyway. Dane reads... In the South Pacific, 1,000 feet beneath the surface, a spaceship rests on the ocean floor. A spaceship at least 300 years old. Rushed to the scene are four scientists. An astrophysicist, a biologist, a mathematician and a psychologist. Together they descend into the depths of the sea to investigate this astonishing find, to search for answers. Has it come from an alien culture? From a different universe? From the future? What happened to the crew and what is the giant silver sphere of alien construction that they find inside the ship? The riddle seems unsolvable. Then someone, or something, begins to transmit messages onto their computer screen. Messages that grow increasingly hostile, hinting at a terrifying power that threatens to destroy their underwater habitat and their very lives. Sphere is Michael Crichton at the top of his form, an astounding combination of action, suspense and science that probes the darkest corners of the mind where man's deadliest enemy lurks. 1,000 feet beneath the sea, the blackest holes are in the mind. So. That blurb already takes you past the point I'm at, and as I say, I'm slightly over halfway through through this. So it's one of those blurbs. But let's go through and check out some tabs. And so uh, basically this team of like, it's a mixed team from the military and then civilian scientists, and they head under the water to investigate the sphere, and we get this little bit of dialogue. What is it? It's a spacecraft crash site. There was a short pause. Norman nodded. I see. That doesn't surprise you, Barnes said. No, Norman said. As a matter of fact, it explains a lot. If a military spacecraft crashed in the ocean, that explains why I haven't heard anything about it on the radio, why it was kept secret, why I was brought here the way I was. When did it crash? Barnes hesitated just a fraction before answering. As best we can estimate, he said, this spacecraft crashed 300 years ago. Dun dun dun. So obviously, before spacecraft were invented. Buyers. This was interesting, this is about like fear responses, I don't know if this is true, but one of the characters in it has done some research and uh, he found that fear responses were minimised when the group was small, five or less, when group members knew each other well, when group members could see each other and were not isolated, when they shared defined group goals and fixed time limits, when groups were mixed aged and mixed gender, and when group members had high phobic tolerant personalities as measured by LAS tests for anxiety, which in turn correlated with athletic fitness. Cool if it is true. So we get some good old fashioned like gore I guess here, so uh, I'll just read it, read it out. Norman felt a sudden chill. In his work with the FAA he had been exposed to every sort of horror. Once in Chicago, at a crash site that extended over a whole farm field, he had stepped on something squishy. He thought it was a frog but it was a child's severed hand, palm up. Another time he had seen a man's charred body still strapped into the seat, except the seat had been flung into the backyard of a suburban house, where it sat upright next to a portable plastic kiddie swimming pool. And in Dallas he had watched the investigators on the rooftops of the suburban houses, collecting the body parts, putting them in bags. They talk about the Drake equation, uh, which gets explained here. What it means, Harry Adams said, is that the probability, P, that intelligent life will evolve in any star system is a function of the probability that the star will have planets, the number of habitable planets, the probability that simple life will evolve on a habitable planet, the probability that intelligent life will evolve from simple life, and the probability that intelligent life will attempt interstellar communication within five billion years. That's all the equation says. Uh-huh, Norman said. But the point is that we have no facts, Harry said. We must guess at every single one of these probabilities. And it's quite easy to guess one way, as Ted does, and conclude that there are probably thousands of intelligent civilizations. It's equally easy to guess, as I do, that there is probably only one civilization, ours. He pushed the paper away. And in that case, whatever is down there is not from an alien civilization. So we're all wasting our time here. And this, I'm not sure if this is true, but just a little interesting note here on child prodigies. So it says, there were really only two kinds of child prodigies, mathematical and musical. Some psychologists argued that there was only one kind, since music was so closely related to mathematics. While there were precocious children with other talents, such as writing, painting and athletics, the only areas in which a child might truly perform at the level of an adult were in mathematics or music. Psychologically, such children were complex, often loners, isolated from their peers and even from their families by their gifts, for which they were both admired and resented. 
Socialization skills are often retarded, making group interactions uncomfortable. And uh, this was interesting because this is also very true as well. So it says, Arthur Levine, the marine biologist, was the only member of the expedition Norman Johnson had not met. It was one of the things we hadn't planned for, he thought. Norman had assumed that any contact with unknown life would occur on land. He hadn't considered the most obvious possibility, that if a spacecraft landed at random somewhere on the Earth, it would most likely come down on water, since 70% of the planet was covered with water. It was obvious in retrospect that they would need a marine biologist. We get this little bit as they're going on the way down as well. Um, oh yes, Ted said, reaching into his pocket. Ted handed the pilot a $10 bill. Norman glanced questioningly at Ted. Didn't they mention that to you? Old tradition. You always pay the pilot on your way down for good luck. I can use some luck, Norman said. He fumbled in his pocket, found a $5 bill, thought better of it, took out a 20 instead. And we get this as well as they're going down. His voice was noticeably higher pitched. It's the helium, Norman. They're pressurizing us with helium. You sound like Donald Duck, Norman said, and he laughed too. His own voice sounded squeaky, like a cartoon character's. Speak for yourself, Mickey, Ted squeaked. I taught I taught a putty tap, Norman said. They were both laughing here in their voices. So I watched this documentary a while back and it was about um, a deep sea accident. I can't remember which one, um, but it covered the rescue operations and it had real audio um, from the divers involved in it. And the same thing happened. And I think that was because they used a lot of helium in the uh, breathing tanks that they gave them. But I just thought that was an interesting detail. And again, another thing that's interesting if true. Uh, so Barnes says, all the deep diving studies show that women are superior for submerged operations. They're physically smaller and consume less nutrients and air, and they have better social skills and tolerate close quarters better, and they are physiologically tougher and have better endurance. The fact is, the Navy long ago recognised that all their submariners should be female. He laughed would just try to implement that one. So they're talking about uh, how the best way to make them comfortable in a new environment is to give them familiar food. Strawberries make me break out, Ted said. I'll make your shortcake with blueberries, Levy said, not missing a beat. And whipped cream, Ted said. Well, you can't have everything, Barnes said. And one of the things you can't have at 30 atmospheres of mixed gas is whipped cream. Won't whip. And then we get the idea that rather than this being an alien spacecraft, it's a man-made spacecraft from the future. So they find a date, Intel Inc. made in USA, um, and it was made in August the 5th, 2043. And they say they're walking through a ship 50 odd years before it was built. So I guess that puts us in 93. Uh, I didn't actually check when this was published. 87. So close to 60 odd years, but and there's a reference. Uh, they were all getting confused about what the Navy people called surface time. Surface time doesn't matter down here, Edmund said in her precise librarian's voice. Day or night, it just doesn't make any difference. You get used to it. And then somebody wants to make a will, but it says, uh, I checked with the surface and you can't do it. It's some legal problem about it being in your own handwriting. You can't transmit your will over electric lines. Yeah, I couldn't transfer the deposit for my house electronically. It had to be done over fax, which is ridiculous in 2021. And we get this, this little bit here. Yeah, Harry said, but the thing is, lie down with dogs, get up with fleas, you know what I mean? Jesus, Beth said, returning. This is like the girl who's raped is always asking for it. Is that what you're saying? No, Harry said, still lifting up floor panels, following the wires. But sometimes you've got to ask what the girl is doing in a dark alley at three in the morning in a bad part of town. Hmm. Troubling. And we get this bit uh, which references the um, Arthur C. Clarke quote about sufficiently advanced technology being like magic. You see, if the technology is advanced enough, it appears to the naive observer to be magic. There's no doubt about that. For example, you take a famous scientist from our past, Aristotle, Leonardo da Vinci, even Isaac Newton. Show him an ordinary Sony coloured television set and he'd run screaming claiming it was witchcraft. He wouldn't understand it at all. Well the point, Ted said, is that you couldn't explain it to him either, at least not easily. Isaac Newton wouldn't be able to understand TV without first studying our physics for a couple of years. He'd have to learn all the underlying concepts, electromagnetism, waves, particle physics. These would all be new ideas to him, a new conception of nature. In the meantime, the TV would be magic as far as he was concerned. But to us, it's ordinary. It's TV. We got this little line. When the psychiatrist goes crazy, it's a bad sign. I'm a psychologist. Whatever. And someone takes, uh, one of the women takes some Valium because uh, she's struggling. She was making decisions too hastily. Is that why you took the Valium? She nodded. I hate to be sloppy. Nobody's criticizing you. If Harry or Ted reviewed my work and found that I'd made these stupid mistakes, what's wrong with a mistake? I can hear them now, just like a woman, not careful enough, too eager to make a discovery, trying to prove herself, too quick to draw conclusions, just like a woman. Nobody's criticising you, Beth. I am. And then we finally get a message from this kind of creature that's messing with them. And it says, hello, how are you? I am fine. What is your name? My name is Jerry. And we get this line, uh, so he starts to talk to them and he says, is there one control entity? 
Ted started laughing. Look what he's asking. I don't get it, Barnes said. Harry said, he's saying take me to your leader. He's asking who's in charge. And then um, Harry gets knocked out and they... Norman bends down, lifts an eyelid, shines a light in Harry's pupil. The pupil contracted. This can't be heaven, Harry said. Why not, Norman said. He shone the light in the other pupil. It contracted. Because you're here, they don't let psychologists into heaven. And we get this little exchange here, which I, I thought was funny, especially because I invest in stocks and shares. Uh, Diet Coke? You're kidding. The can design is different, and I'm afraid it's warm, but it's Diet Coke, all right. I'm buying stock in that company, Harry said. Now we know it'll be still be there in 50 years. He read the can. Official drink of the Star Voyager expedition. Yeah, it's a promo, Beth said. Harry turned the can around. The other side was printed in Japanese. Wonder what this means? It means don't buy that stock after all, she said. So this was interesting as well. They're talking about stopping someone from being conscious. Um, but if he dreams, he might be creating stuff in his dreams. And it says, I think anything that produces unconsciousness will work, I think. I hope you're right, Beth said, because if he starts dreaming and then manifests the monsters from his dreams, that wouldn't be very good. No, but anesthesia produces a dreamless total state of unconsciousness. I'm not sure if that's true because I've been under anaesthetic and apparently, I mean, I was young, so I don't remember it, but apparently I told my mum that I dreamt. And then we get this, which totally ruined my suspension of disbelief. With your hands full of snakes, you look like Medusa. What is that, a rock star? No, it's a mythological figure. The one who killed her children, she asked with a quick suspicious glance. Beth, ever alert to a veiled insult. No, that's somebody else, that was Medea. Medusa was a mythical woman with a head full of snakes who turned men to stone if they looked at her. Perseus killed her by looking at her reflection in his polished shield. Sorry, Norman, not my field. How can you not know who Medusa is? Then we got a reference to the Wizard of Oz, which is interesting because literally as I was reading this, about 20 minutes before I read that line, um, I was chatting to Joel Swagman here on Booktube and we're gonna buddy read the Wizard of Oz series. So it was just really weird to see that. Oh, and then um, basically one of the characters tries to escape from the habitat and he's kind of feeling himself being pulled up by the current and he realizes that if he does that, he'll drown. And then when he gets to the surface, the change in pressure will pop him like a balloon. So yeah, Sphere by Michael Crichton wasn't my favourite of his to be honest, I mean it was still pretty good, it's just that I think his others are a lot better. Um, I probably gave it a weak 3.5 out of 5, on Goodreads I downgraded it to a 3 stars, but we'll be generous here and give it 3.5. Not my favourite, but if it sounds like the kind of thing you might like, check it out. Also I've got paint in my hair, and all over my hands you can see, I've been painting my house before I move out. So, there we have it, that's what I made of Sphere by Michael Crichton. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.